Hey guys, this is um, lecture number one for Communication Development and Disorders, D EDUC 225, um, from chapter number one. You need a couple things. You need to make sure you have your interactive notebook handy, a pencil to take some notes, chapter one note page, and you may choose to um, glue that on the inside cover of your notebook, or that just might be one of the first pages in your notebook, um, and the levels of language um, note page that you will also need. So let's get, go ahead and get started. Um, first, what is language? I want You're going to pause this lecture a couple times, um, and this is going to be the first time. I want you to write a definition in your notebook um, on your next clean page. This is probably going to be um, labeled um, lecture number one, but I want you to tell me in your own words, what is language? What is it? What is it not? Is it just noise or can it be something else? Write down examples in your notebook by pausing this presentation before moving on. Now we have two types of language that we're going to talk about in this class. One is called receptive language and the other is expressive. And you can see um, these girls are um, taking part in both types. One is receiving, the little girl with her hand um, by her ear, she's receiving the language. And the other little girl with the little paper microphone, she is um, expressing herself. She is um, sending out the language. And so our language can be broken down in the simplest form in those two ways, receptive and expressive. And those are going to be two vocabulary words that you need to know. Um, because if someone is having an issue with language, we have to first determine is it with their receptive language or their expressive language. From there, we can break it down into five aspects of language. Now, you need that note page for um, this and it is going to have five different boxes and we have a box for phonological, semantic, syntactic, morphemic, and pragmatic. And you can kind of see how um, phonological language is at the very bottom and it kind of um, morphs all the way up and it grows and grows and grows. So we're going to talk about each one of those. You can see those five um, aspects over on the left, we need to make sure that we know what phonological language means. Semantic, syntactic, morphemic, and pragmatic. We need to know those really well. That's why some people choose to put this on the inside of their notebook, because we're going to talk about those five aspects in um, children of diversity. We're going to talk about those five aspects in um, infancy, toddler, preschool, primary years, all of those things. We're going to keep hitting on those five over and over and over again. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first one, phonological um, language. You can hear it, the first little bit in there, that base of the word, phono, is relating to sound. Um, and this is our sound symbol relations. A phoneme is the smallest part of the word. You need to make sure that you know that. Um, and phonemic awareness in preschool children can begin to manipulate their language, okay? So in a preschool child, they might be able to do something called blending, okay? I can say, um, the child can say, M, U, N for moon, okay? And so they can put together those words, okay, what word makes, M is from, M, Ooh, mm. They can blend them all together. Oh, that's moon. You can also have them um, segment the words, pull apart those sm small sounds, those phonemes. Can you break apart for me the word moon? What are the three sounds you hear? And the child should be able to tell us, typically in preschool, getting into kindergarten age, mm, ooh, mm. okay? Now, phonics is learned in school to help children learn to read, but it's not the only skill that is needed. Phonemic awareness is the ability to detect, just like we are doing, and use individual sounds and spoken, not written word, okay? So now we're only talking about in phonological, remember phone, sound, we're only talking about spoken word. It is the glue that helps kids with phonics and reading and spelling. 
Research shows that children with strong phonemic awareness is the biggest indicator if a kid will be able to read. Without it, they will have struggles in reading. Okay, so things I need for you to remember. Phonological, phono, the sound. Phoneme is the smallest part of the word. And phonemic awareness is a child's ability to manipulate their language, those sounds in speech, okay? As we continue on there, um, you can um, watch a video. It's a phonemic awareness video, and it's called Fun with Phonemes. If you go on to our Canvas page, I believe it's the very bottom link. What I want you to do there is I want you to... Um, pause this video and then watch. It's about a three minute video and I want you to watch um, and describe in your notebook a game that was played in the video. So go ahead and do that now and then come back to us. Okay, so we have some prosodic features in language. We have in an intonation, tempo, loudness, and rhythm and all of those things are part of the sound of speech that we can hear okay so intonation um, is what syllable um, what emphasis you put on each part of the word um, a lot of times that happens with pitch or cadence the rise and fall of your voice tempo is the speed just like music loudness you can convey meaning through how loud you are speaking and, of course, rhythm, kind of the flow of how a person speaks. All of those things are prosodic features, and you need to know that simple term. It is intonation, tempo, loudness, and rhythm. Moving on to semantic knowledge. Um, semantic knowledge is when oral symbols and spoken words have meaning, okay? So if we're thinking about a baby, a baby can make sounds, but a baby doesn't understand that those oral symbols, those spoken words have meaning. For example, when um, Charlotte was little, she would say wawa, and we would know that meant water. She would say mookin, and we would know that meant music. She was understanding, hey, if I say this specific word, that or this specific sound, it's going to get me something I want, water or music or mom or dog. Um, schemata is a cognitive structure representing interactions between concepts. So semantics is the meaning that we find in language and the algorithms of human language. That schemata is those cognitive structures, those, those meanings behind certain concepts. And you can see in the visual there, our schema is all the information that's stored in our, our, our uh, brain. And that schema is kind of like a file folder. It helps us make meaning and understanding of what we read. We put together what we read with our schema to make meaning. Um, and good readers activate their schema before, during, and after reading. So if I say dog, you're going to get a visual mental picture in your head. Now, your dog might look different than my dog. Um, and a very young person, let's say like a two-year-old, their um, schema of dog might be four legs and hair. Well, that can also include a goat or a pony. Um, and so it's those oral sounds with meaning attached to them. That is semantics, okay? From there, we are going with syntactic. We have our smallest sounds of words with phonological. We have those um, sounds attached to meaning. That is semantics. And then we've moved into syntactics. Syntactics are the words combining into sentences and those sentences making meaningful phrases and that is syntactic knowledge. Um, syntax itself is the word order or grammar. So um, I would say children um, probably around like two years old are learning how to string together those couple words to get exactly what they want. Um, a very young child might understand mama means that particular woman. But if I want her to do something specifically, I'm going to have to string together a couple different words to get her to do exactly what I want, just not 
you know, glance her eyes over to me. Um, I want might want mama up or mama come. That idea of stringing those words together is going to be able to help um, a little person communicate um, exactly what they want. From there, we have morphemic. Morphemic is the knowledge of word structure. It's more simple than you think. Um, so for cat, the difference between cat and cats, we know that, oh, cats, you have more than one cat. That's the knowledge of word structure. Um, the idea of happy, happiness, happily. Maybe you don't know what happiness means, but you know that root word happy, just like how we did with phonological. Well, I'm not really sure what that specific word means, but I know that P-H-O-N-O, -O, phono, means sound, and so you can help um, understand things. This knowledge of words helps children to comprehend other speech better. And um, some things that you need to know, um, morphemes. Um, morphemes are something that can stand alone to function as words. And those type of morphemes are called free morphemes. Um, they, compromise, they comprise simple words like, um, um, let's say, uh, the, run, on, well, and then um, compound words, okay? So if I was going to say like keyboard is a compound word, greenhouse, bloodshed, smartphone, all of those things are, um, are free morphemes because they are simple words put together and now they're compound words. Morphemes can only be attached to another part of a word and cannot stand alone are called bound morphemes. For example, our prefixes pre, dis, in, un, our suffixes fool, able, meant, li, eyes, like ise, like compromise. Um, so again, our free morphemes can stand alone, simple words, they can un, um, convey meaning to um, a speaker. Our bound morphemes are parts that can't stand alone, okay? So if I had, um, let's see, um, dislike. Dis is that bound morpheme. But I can understand what the, what the prefix dis means and like, and so I can then again use my morphemic knowledge and understand what those type of words mean. Um, is this going to happen right away and with toddler children no but it's going to happen a lot quicker than uh, you might think so that is morphemic knowledge the knowledge of word structure and then i have my pragmatic knowledge pragmatic knowledge is the knowledge of how to use language in different situations i speak differently to you guys than i do my family doctor or even my pediatrician or even um my financial consultant Dr. Beam, um, the president, I'm going to speak differently with different people than I'm in different situations with. Um, there are different registers that you use. I might use a very um, traditional register if I'm speaking to someone um, that I find in high regard. I might find, um, I might speak to um, Dr. Beam if we are just talking about what our plans are for this weekend in a very relaxed register. Um, I will speak to you guys during class more in an academic register or if I am talking to um, a principal at a school we work with or a colleague I'm going to speak in an academic register but those registers are the knowledge of how I'm going to change my language with whom I'm speaking to okay so that should be your five aspects of language um, note page. Now I want you guys to go to that triangle levels of language knowledge. You have three levels there. You have linguistic, metalinguistic, and the verbalization of metalinguistic. Linguistic knowledge um, we are going to find in toddlers and preschool students. Um, they are working on grammar, plural forms, cat or cat. They are working on please and thank you the knowledge of how to use language to communicate. All of these things they're playing with, they're testing out. That's why a lot of times in this linguistic knowledge level, kids are gonna say funny things because they're just practicing, they're, they're testing things out. 
You might even see kids who maybe try to drop a little cuss word in here. They're going to see, hmm, is this going to get the effect I think it might? Um, but they are just playing with that language. The next one is a metalinguistic knowledge. Um, this is going to be some of our um, more mature preschoolers and kindergarten students. They're going to manipulate language to communicate effectively. So they are going to play with words to get them to be able to express exactly what they're thinking. They're going to be able to play um, rhyming games. They're going to answer questions about word parts. They're going to be really able to break apart words, put them back together, um, put together funny nonsense words. They're going to be able to do those type of things in preschool and kindergarten. From there, we're going to get to verbalization, and that's our top level there. That's kindergarten and primary years. Those children are... Um, um, going to interact with others and as they're interacting with others in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, they're acquiring this verbalization. They are going to be able to verbally respond to questions about s specific language features um, and that's when you start really seeing like an, a, a pretty hardcore um, language arts class um, being represented in the classroom. And they are going to be able to understand humor. A lot of times if you tell a kid a joke, they might laugh, but they are not laughing because it's funny. They're laughing because their peers are learning. But in this verbalization level of language knowledge, they're going to start to really understand why something is funny because they understand um, the meaning of words and they understand um, the concept of how something can actually be funny when we are playing with language. Now, I want you to kind of pause here and reflect on this image. You have our five aspects of language at the top, phonological, semantic, syntactic, morphemic, and pragmatic. And then you can see how they're represented through oral language and written language. I want you to um, pause this and reflect on this image. How does oral and written language progress the same and how do they look differently? Go ahead and put that in your notebook. When you are finished reflecting on this image, you are finished with lecture one.